From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Etazaz, and this matters. During the months of fighting this pandemic, we are all experiencing the world as many of us have never done before. A world that is not easily accessible, where we are restricted by a deadly virus, and where our work, our finances, and our day-to-day lives have become severely limited. This has become the new normal. In a way, for the first time, we are sharing the same lived experience as many others whose lives have always been this way, even before the pandemic. Vice recently did a video series collecting the voices of disabled people about how they're going through this time. It reinforces this feeling of being kind of left behind and iced out of society. We live in a world that's filled with ableism and biases against the disability community. Disabled people's lives matter. They deserve to live through this pandemic. More than two and a half million Ontarians live with some kind of disability. A lot of them are seniors, one of the most vulnerable when it comes to contracting COVID-19. Living with a disability itself makes it challenging enough to get through a day. What we are going through every day in the midst of a pandemic, that might be every day in the life of a disabled person. But COVID-19 has posed bigger roadblocks, from equitable access to healthcare, financial constraints, to something as basic as being able to access the crucial information they need at this time to protect themselves from a pandemic with dignity. All of these are problems that many disabled people say makes them feel like they've been forgotten. So today, I talked to a disability rights advocate and entrepreneur, Mayan Ziv, to speak about the struggles and the rights of the disabled community and what we need to do to make them a part of our conversation and our collective experience. Mayan Ziv is a disability rights activist and founder of the digital platform Access Now. Thank you so much, Mayan, for joining me on the podcast. So excited to be here, Saba. So the time of this pandemic has been difficult for all of us. But do you think we're missing an important conversation here? How has COVID-19 been exceptionally challenging for the disabled community? Yeah, I think there's definitely an entire conversation that I don't think is known to the general population. I can remember, you know, when the lockdown first hit, there were a lot of these kind of really organic, scrappy Google Docs that were happening between people with disabilities, trying to scrounge together resources, information, and different people that they could lean on to kind of put together their own guides, their own educational materials, and their own plans to prepare for the pandemic that was kind of happening all around us. And I think even just that signal that it took people within their own little communities and their own networks to try and look beyond mainstream media Mm. to find their own resources is kind of the first signal to show that the disability community wasn't really part of the conversations that we were hearing from how to prepare, how to plan, how to manage your own health, the risks associated. You know, there were terms like immunocompromised group that we hear in the media, but those often Mm. came with kind of this fear of well, what if I identify as one of those people? And on the flip side, we heard people go, oh, well, you, I'm not that person, I should be fine. And the entire way that that narrative started to roll out in the the early days of COVID, I think have really lasted with us, but we are beginning to finally see people hopefully realize that people with disabilities specifically are really taking quite a difficult blow during this really difficult time for everyone. I'm sure. And uh, having to collect and find your own resources during what is already such an anxious time. That's actually what I wanted to ask you. How do you think Ontario or overall Canada has done so far in protecting the disabled during this COVID-19 crisis? Specifically, do you feel like their needs might have been left out during the emergency planning and preventive measures and all of the information that was coming out? Like you said, a lot of people were just trying to generate their own resources. Yes, I think that when it comes to the education front, other than saying that COVID-19 was 
obviously most aggressively hurting people within an immunocompromised group, there wasn't really much more information for people with disabilities to grasp onto. So even things like what happens if I get COVID? Should I go to the hospital like somebody else or not? Would I be able to go with a caregiver? There have been stories of people who've actually been denied care because they have a disability or a pre-existing condition. And so they were almost even nervous to disclose out of fear of actually being not treated because of that. And, you know, we've heard so many stories about the scarcity of resources and the need to flatten the curve. But I think the narrative definitely did not really pay enough sensitivity to the needs of people with disabilities. And as things have progressed and evolved, we've started to recognize the different needs of different people. But even the stats show that the people who are being hit the hardest are within long-term care facilities or people who are within an elderly population. And some of the narratives or the understandings that needed to come out earlier to prevent that from happening in the first place, I think we're really missing. And it's unfortunate because now we're actually seeing the results of that. And through a more personal lens, what's been your experiencing like managing through this pandemic? Yeah, for me, you know, I, I was pretty quick to realize that things were going to get pretty serious pretty quickly. So even before there was any kind of enforced lockdown. Me and, and many people that I know in a similar position kind of went into isolation pretty quickly. Usually I'm actually in the city. I moved out of the city to kind of remove myself from a dense population, moved to spend time with my family to also make sure that if there were any gaps in my care, because now I wanted to also reduce the amount of people who are coming and going into my home. I moved to my family home and started to make these kinds of adjustments to my life just to prepare, but definitely had no idea the extent or the length of an isolation period that we would be in. And my family and I have definitely made a lot of sacrifices when it comes to engaging within the community. And even now, as we get into other phases where things start to open up, really still having to be quite isolated and quite strict on the measures that we take so that there is really no risk or as much of a reduced risk of exposure as possible. And you're talking about all of these extraordinary measures that you had to take in this challenging time. Did you feel there were gaps in care or it was something you had to prepare for? Did you struggle with that? I lost one of my caregivers who was needing to take the TTC every day to come and go. And she works in many places. And so that was kind of the first thing that happened where I started to have to juggle some of my own care. And I was thankful and, and fortunate that my family was able to step in. But you know, that's really not the case for many people. And I've heard stories from friends of mine who were now, you know, with, with many hours without care or kind of scrambling to find other people who could step in and even trying to mitigate, you know, I need help, but I'm also afraid to let somebody into my home. There's so many kind of things that people with disabilities have had to negotiate with themselves just to get through the day, which I think these kinds of narratives are really not known to the general right. population and things that really can come at quite a shocking level when you start to connect all the dots of the people who are either losing employment because they're often caregivers for other people or people on the other end who, you know, are in need of care and not able to actually get that. And even something basic in terms of, let's say, COVID testing, for example, how easy or hard is it for people with disabilities to get a test or get over the anxiety and feel like they need a test? Yeah, it, it's a good question. I personally have not felt that I needed a test and haven't gone through that process. I think one of the biggest concerns that I've heard from within my community is I may need a test, but also determining whether or not the risk is worthwhile for me to expose myself to a population outside of my own home in order to receive the test, like there are these kind of negotiations, again, that people have to have with themselves. But I think beyond testing, if you look at even other procedures, I was scheduled to go and meet with a doctor for kind of an ongoing procedure that I've been looking to book, and really had to figure out how dire or how bad does it need to get before I felt safe enough to risk going into a hospital to actually get help for something else. And I think that's really the story that I'm hearing from a lot of people, whether it's, you know, to fix something on my wheelchair, or I have another medical appointment that's been delayed or canceled, or 
that I need to keep, but I don't feel safe enough to actually go and get the help I need right now. And what about us as a society? What have you observed that we've been doing that could be negatively affecting disabled people during this time? I'm glad you asked, Emma, <laughs> because I think, honestly, this is the biggest pain point for me personally, and one that I think we could really work harder on trying to improve from a, something as simple as keeping distance from other people and from you know, recognizing that although you on a personal kind of individual stance might feel comfortable to be closer to somebody else, there are many other people who don't feel that that is a safe option for them and to not have the ability to control that when they're out in public. And for someone, you know, for example, for me, I was taking a walk and someone just kind of walked by really close to me with a group of people, didn't wear a mask. And and on some level, I actually felt violated. Like I felt like there was this trust that had been broken and that it was actually quite a violent act. And it seems so simple. And pre-COVID, this is something we would never have thought about. But in these current times, something as simple as hanging out with a group, not keeping distance, not wearing a mask. These are simple things that we can do to help protect others that are in a more vulnerable or risky position. And as you said, Mayan, these are just basic consideration and thoughtful actions that everybody should be practicing. And yet we see a lot of the experiences like you mentioned. How can we understand that disabled people occupy the same spaces as us, that they're part of our collective shared experience? What do we need to do to help and include them as individuals and as a society? I think the first thing that really needs to happen, and, I, and I'm seeing quite a reluctance from many people to do this, is to recognize that things are not as they were before. And that something as simple as going to a restaurant and sitting on a patio might have not had any impact on anybody else other than yourself in the past. But now that's not the case. And so making these sacrifices or these adjustments in your day-to-day life or asking, you know, is this a must-have or is this a nice-to-have? And these kinds of questions are things that we each need to grapple with every day. And I know that it's tiring. And I know that, you know, after so many days and so many months of this kind of quarantine pandemic world that we're living in, people have become frustrated and they want to go out and they want to experience the summer and they want to feel lifted from this kind of really strict measures that we've been living in. But I think as we move into further phases, opening up too quickly, I think we'll end up seeing kind of the reverse of what we want. And that the consequences and the sacrifices that we've made until now are really important to protect, not only for ourselves as an entire society, but definitely for those who are kind of in a more vulnerable category. And I also want to speak about accessibility since that's your platform. Uh, We know there's legislation according to Ontario's accessibility law to make Ontario barrier-free and accessible to people with disabilities by 2025. How do you think things are progressing? Does it feel like Ontario is becoming more friendly to people with disabilities? You know, pre-COVID, this was such a different conversation. It's so interesting to, you know, I work at a company that's focused on connecting people with and without disabilities to an accessible world. So really looking at the built environment and determining do these places have accessible washrooms and parking spots and elevators and kind of anything that someone with any kind of access need would need to know about. And, you know, in the world that we live in now, a lot of that has been really closed off. And so for me, I think, you know, we have this opportunity, first of all, to take a moment to generate empathy. We're all kind of, for the first time in our lives, many of us, experiencing what limited or no access is actually like. And that's really quite a transformational moment that for the first time, as a collective around the world, people have the opportunity for just a glimmer of a moment, understand what it's like for a person with a disability to not have access to their store or to their community or to do the thing that they normally would like to do. I think that's actually a really exciting opportunity. And although it comes with a really difficult 
moment that, you know, no one would ever wish for, it does present itself an opportunity to generate empathy and to think about what accessibility means, not just for people with disabilities, but how accessibility could actually benefit every person on the planet. So in a way, you're saying that the pandemic has somewhat hindered moving towards a more accessible space for Canadians, but it's also built this space of empathy where everybody is now in the same boat. I hope so. Yeah. Things like delivery of groceries or the ability to work from home or to do anything remotely, to use technology to to gain access in a way that you might not be able to out in the world. These are the kinds of tools and accommodations that people with disabilities have always advocated for. And all of a sudden, you know, everybody across Canada is needing to do the same thing. And so all of a sudden, you know, when Zoom doesn't work right, people get frustrated. Or if they're not able to get their groceries delivered within, you know, a certain reasonable amount of time, it's like, oh, this app doesn't work well. Yet this is the experience that people with disabilities have had forever. And accessibility of the ability to get groceries delivered to your door, to use technology in an accessible way, to gain employment that might be remote or with flexible hours. These things actually benefit all of us. And these are all components of accessibility. And I want to talk a little bit about your work, about your platform Access Now. How has that made a difference in the life of its users, of uh, disabled people? Well, it really started with my own personal experience. You know, I've used a wheelchair throughout my whole life and constantly have just been curious and going places that often people have told me, you know, that's not going to be accessible or I don't think you can and have just had to work to be creative to figure it out. Along the way, you know, the frustration that builds up is a person who constantly has to go through the back door or the the garbage entrance or shows up at a hotel in New York City and there's four steps to the entrance with my bags and everything packed. Those constant moments of frustration really is the catalyst that led to the development of Access Now. And to date, the whole point of Access Now is really to empower people with disabilities and anyone who needs access, parents with strollers, delivery services, teachers, you name it. We all kind of need access at some point. It's really to empower people to connect with places that are actually welcoming, places that are barrier free, and to highlight information about places that might not be accessible as well. So we can begin to inform, hopefully, future investment and future development of barrier breaking. So in Canada, yes, we have new laws that address accessibility. And in Ontario, we've had the AODA for a long time. But how can we now use data to actually invest in and understand where we need to improve upon when it comes to accessibility? And I think that's really been the biggest power that we've had at Access Now is giving agency and autonomy to people with disabilities who now have the ability to raise their voices and contribute to something that's so much more impactful as a whole. And you're talking about data and technology How important is the role that it can play in creating a more accessible and equitable world? And what are you most excited about right now in terms of tech platforms that can actually do this? Yeah, you know, technology, I think, is the greatest connector. And in many ways, the the most empowering tool we have. It lets us do things way beyond our, our human physical ability. It connects us to people and places around the world. And constantly, we're discovering new ways that we can innovate or create new technologies that allow us to do more stuff, whether it's to create new civilizations on other planets or discover things that we didn't know about ourselves as a humanity. I know that sounds super philosophical, but I think, you know, for me, it's really inspiring to think about the ways that we can use technology. For one of the things that's most exciting to me right now is the application of artificial intelligence to empowering people with disabilities to do more. And I think that that's kind of new frontier in the world of technology that I think is really, really exciting. And I want to end this by bringing this conversation back to us as individuals, as a society, because it does eventually fall on us. So what are some changes that people can make today, right now, that could make a difference beyond this conversation about putting more financial resources, beyond technology? What can we do? The simplest thing you can do is 
is be aware that your actions are actually not limited to only your own footprint. It sounds so simple and basic, but it's so important in the time that we live in. So think about the impact of your actions on other people. Take a moment to be educated if you aren't yet about the circumstances that other people are living in. So the simple thing like wearing a mask when you're in public or keeping distance from other people, obviously, really, really important. And then I think it just becomes a, a matter of, of being curious and comfortable enough to maybe not be familiar with a subject matter like accessibility or perhaps the perspective of someone with a disability, but not allowing ignorance to be kind of where the conversation ends. There are so many resources and conversations online and so many initiatives that are happening around the world when it comes to disability and accessibility advocacy that I think, you know, we live in a world where it's not really an option to continue to live in kind of a ignorance is bliss mentality. It's really time to recognize that we have let many people down and finding ways to correct that, finding ways to create more just or inclusive conversations even as a start is what I believe will be the first step to creating a much more inclusive future. Thank you so much for your time, Maya. And I think you've got a lot of people thinking today on this episode. Thanks so much, Sama. That was Maya Ziv, a disability rights activist and founder of the digital platform Access Now. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazas, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Bye.